Even people who don't quite remember that Hobbes was a 17th century English philosopher do remember that he said that life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, that life outside of government is a war of all against all, and that the only way to escape this miserable condition is to set up an absolute sovereign, a more or less a totalitarian state ruled perhaps by a dictator. In the middle of the last century, the basic elements of this popular rap on Hobbes were firmly fixed in academic Hobbes scholarship. Um, Hobbes was said to have a pessimistic view of human nature as egoistic, uh, acquisitive, and competitive. Individuals care only about themselves, and primarily they care about avoiding their own death. They're rational calculators of their self-interest, um, and so can be motivated by strategically designed threats. A well-designed state keeps order by using credible threats of force to bring individual rational self-interest into line with collective interest. Uh, punishments exact costs that make it more rational for the individual to comply with the society's rules than to defect from them. The basic Hobbesian formula for maintaining social order, as scholars of the last century saw it, was um, roughly might plus fright makes order. Um, the power to punish combines with the fear of punishment to yield social quiet. Right does not enter this equation. In fact, might replaces right because people are motivated by material gains, not morals, by their interests, not their ideals. This way of understanding Hobbes made his theory seem practically useful. It could be used to model the interactions of nation states in the international arena. Hobbes was uh, a paradigm theorist of realpolitik, the idea that states pursue their national self-interest. During the Cold War, Hobbesian assumptions could be used to understand the strategic balance of power um, and were used particularly toward the end of the century to devise nuclear deterrence strategies. MAD, the policy of mutual assured destruction pursued by the United States and the Soviet Union against one another, counted on states to pursue their rational self-interest when balancing the potential gains from aggressions against the potential losses imposed by nuclear retaliation. The Hobbesian conceptions of human nature and political dynamics were making the world safe for democracy, well, and also for communism. According to the interpretation of that generation, the two central assumptions of Hobbes' philosophy are, first, that people can be counted on to act rationally, to rationally <coughs> pursue what they care most about, and secondly, that people care most about keeping themselves alive. But there are two problems with attributing these assumptions to Hobbes. The first is that on these assumptions, we can't explain how social disorders like revolutions occur, um, which Hobbes thinks they do frequently, and this worries him. Uh, going to war against your government is dangerous, um, not only because you may well be killed in the fighting, uh, but also because if you lose, you're you know, likely to be executed. But for rational people who care most about avoiding death, it will seldom make sense to rebel against the government particularly against any government strong enough to be effective in governing, which of course is what we want from governments. And if people were irrational enough uh, to do that, um, the might plus fright remedy those interpreters say Hobbes proposes wouldn't work anyway. A person who's too irrational to understand that war may be hazardous to his health isn't apt to be kept docile by the ordinary threat of punishment. So if Hobbes had made those assumptions, his theory of social disorder and its remedy would have been conceptually incoherent. The second problem is that both of these assumptions are factually false. They're just not true. People aren't always rational, and they often care more about other people and moral causes, religious causes, and accomplishing personal goals than they do about saving their own skins. Uh, there's lots of empirical evidence that people often act irrationally. Um, they prefer a more immediate good to a greater good, as the famous uh, marshmallow experiment shows. Okay. They overestimate the probability of outcomes they want, so they play the lottery. They underestimate the value of the things uh, that they can't get, like the fox did uh, with the grapes that he couldn't reach in Aesop's fable. They act on passionate impulses, 
Uh, they suffer from weakness of will. You know, they tell themselves they're on a diet while they're eating yet another donut. But states also behave irrationally. Um, and we certainly don't assume that they won't. If we really believe that state actors are always rational, we wouldn't worry about other states having nuclear weapons because we would assume that they'd be deterred from using them by our threat of retaliation. Israel, which has nuclear weapons, wouldn't care if Iran develops them. Uh, nor would we, with our overwhelming deterrent capability. We wouldn't care about Iran, we wouldn't care about North Korea for that matter. Um, but we do, and not just because we know that people do not always act rationally. We also know that not everyone takes avoiding their own death to be the most important thing. Patriots sacrifice their lives for their country. Uh, martyrs die for their God. Parents will typically risk death to protect their children, while explorers and adventurers and you know, extreme athletes um, will risk their lives to push the boundaries of knowledge or of accomplishment. The purpose of life is not just to not die. If it were, we'd be in for a really sad surprise uh, sooner or later. We want to realize certain purposes. Um, and some of these purposes are worth dying for. Um, many, many purposes seem to be worth risking death for. Hobbes knew full well that people are often motivated by their passions rather than by their reason, and that avoiding death is not the most important thing for many, maybe even for most people. <coughs> Transcendent interests, interests for the satisfaction of which a person is willing to die if need be, play an enormous role in human life and an enormous role in social disorder. If there were nothing people were willing to die for, they wouldn't take up arms against their government or each other, um, except to defend themselves from being killed. But people initiate rebellions and revolutions and insurgencies and go to war all the time to further religious aims or for moral ideals like justice or equality or self-determination. Americans in the Cold War era said, better dead than red. Hobbes is the great philosophical theorist of the role of transcendent interests in causing social disorder. This is his real legacy. The mere fact that people are pursuing transcendent interests is not enough by itself to generate conflict. If everyone's pursuing the same interest and they agree on what course of action will satisfy it, there's no cause for strife. If there's no division of opinion, if we're all on the same page, you know, no problem. Hobbes analyzed social disorder as the result of divided judgments about what to do, which often result from divided allegiances to divided governing powers, which then engage people's transcendent interests in opposing directions on both sides. The challenge, as Hobbes thought, was of centralizing and unifying authority, because division of governmental powers, say, among multiple authorities, and especially multiple sources exercising overlapping authority, invite destabilizing conflict. Uh, a possible paralysis of effective social order, possible paralysis of government, um, and even civil war. The vision of ultimate authority among branches of government to exercise the essential governmental functions of legislation, adjudication, enforcement, you know, re revenue collection, prosecution of wars, and so on. This is one sort of problematic case. For when the holders of these disparate functions disagree about what's to be done and refuse to cooperate with one another, we can expect either a uh, paralyzing stalemate, um, we saw this a couple of years ago in the U.S. government shutdown when the, houses, uh, when the houses of Congress couldn't agree on a bill to fund the government, or more likely hop spot, attempts by the various partial rights holders um, to usurp the whole range of rights they need to be able to function effectively. Hobbes illustrates um, a more extreme case in the engraved frontispiece he commissioned to depict the content of his masterwork, Leviathan. <coughs> this is what Hobbes put uh, below that big picture on either side of the title banner to illustrate the overlapping authority that concerns him. 
Here we see parallel systems of fully overlapping authority over Christian subjects. State and church each have uh, a sovereign, indicated by the crown and the bishop's mitre, a kind of force they exercise, ordinary physical force, the weapons of war, these are ordinary weapons, you know, standards, um, bayonets, rifles. These are the weapons that um, the church uses to assert its authority over Christians. These are concepts, spiritual distinctions that enable them to assert their power in this realm. Uh, and the battlefields on which side each uh, fights, uh, ordinary battlefields and university disputations among divines where they actually assert uh, that they have ultimate authority over Christian subjects. Hobbes' analysis of disorder rings true in the world that we see around us. Uh, we saw an example of the paralysis of effective government because of division of governmental powers um, last November uh, in Libya, when Libya's Supreme Court ruled that the country's elected parliament was seated unconstitutionally, throwing the country into a fresh spasm of violence following the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime, because one faction welcomed the court's ruling as lending legitimacy to its claim to authority, while its rivals rejected the ruling. Um, this led to civil war, as Hobbes theorized division of governmental power often does. We see Hobbes' claim that conflicting conceptions of religious duty lead people to ally with different religious authorities, causing civil war, pretty clearly illustrated in Iraq. Ever since the downfall of the regime of Saddam Hussein in 2003, the Shia-Sunni sectarian conflict has been the driving force behind the civil war in Iraq. I mean, indeed, that, that conflict has driven a lot of uh, <coughs> conflict throughout the Middle East. Examples uh, abound of transcendent interests making political conflicts intractable uh, because force can't resolve them. The campaign of self-immolations undertaken by Tibetans opposed to Chinese rule. Um, there have been 137 fatalities in the last five years. Um, these continue, right, despite the harsh response by Chinese authorities. Current American political commentators are coming to appreciate the problem that Hobbes was theorizing 350 years ago. The problem of what New York Times columnist Tom Friedman calls the undeterrables people who can't be deterred by threat of force. Um, in some uh, cases, religiously motivated groups. The conservative columnist David Brooks observed last month, and here I quote, people don't join ISIS because they want better jobs with more benefits. ISIS is led by people who don't care if their earthly standard of living improves. They're disgusted by the pleasures we value. And the emphasis on happiness in this world, which we take as public life's ultimate end. They're doing it because they think it will ennoble their souls. My point is that much social disruption is carried out by people acting on interests that transcend their desire to avoid their present bodily death. To get people to the point of action against the state, of taking up arms, there are three conditions which he thinks are each necessary but only jointly sufficient to bring people to rebel. Our discontent, pretense of right, and hope of success. It's all you need is a leader. So he writes, to dispose men to sedition, three things concur. The first is discontent. For as long as a man thinketh himself well, and that the present government standeth not in his way to hinder his perceiving from well to better, it's impossible for him to desire the change thereof. The second is pretense of right. For though a man be discontent, yet if in his own opinion there be no just cause of stirring against or resisting the government established, he'll never show it. The third is hope of success, for it were madness to attempt without hope, when to fail is to die the death of a traitor. Without these three, discontent, pretense, and hope, there can be no rebellion. And when the same are all together, there wanted nothing thereto but a man of credit to set up the standard and to blow the trumpet that is a leader. When you have a cause you're willing to die for, that is some serious motivation. Transcendent interests are pretense of right, you might say, on steroids. Brute force does not work against people motivated by transcendent interests. They have to be persuaded by appeal to their principles. So might plus fright won't work on people motivated by transcendent interests. 